So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the latest episode of Cannabis Unlocked. Today, I'm your host, Jordan Euclid, one of the founding partners with Key Investment Partners, and I am very excited to be joined by Guillermo Rodriguez of Summit Virtual CFO by Anders. Guillermo, how are you doing today? Doing great. Thanks, Jordan, for having me on. Yeah, thanks for joining. Really excited to have you on and talk about uh, what it's like working with clients in the cannabis industry. Yeah, you bet. I'm I'm looking forward to the the conversation today. Fantastic. So with that, Guillermo, would uh, love if you would give a little bit of background on your personal history and your and your career path and how you ended up to uh, Summit. Sure, sure. Yeah. So like like you said, it it has been a, a bit of a path for me. I um, I graduated with, you know, an accounting degree way back in 03. So I've been in accounting and finance right at about 20 years. Um, at the time, I, I did want to work for a CPA firm. I've always liked working with small business owners and getting into a variety of industries. But I actually went to go work in in industry uh, right out of college. I worked for a large contractor that was, you know, large enough to give me a lot of our variety in my work. You know, we're about a four billion dollar company at the time, and so you know, I worked in all these different departments. I was in internal audit, and then I worked in financial accounting. But then um, there was a, a time in the in the company, we had to make an acquisition. And so that's at the time I left the accounting world and work, went to go work in corporate finance to support the acquisition through the forecasting process and uh, rec- raising capital in the high yield market. And so that really kind of changed my my career path from more of a historical accountant, you know, looking at the past and then looking more forward, more strategically, mm-hmm. trying to raise capital for the business and and manage manage cash flow, all the kind of things that that you typically see in a in a corporate finance world. Um, and so that was going along great and I uh, was learning a ton. But then at the time that COVID hit, kind of like like everybody else, I started to look around and see what what I really wanted to do. And um going back to what I've always wanted to do is to work with with different clients and small business owners. I, I felt like this was my opportunity. And so um you know, really wanted to work with something that I was really passionate in. And for me, it's, it's, you know, alternative medicine, it's plant-based medicine. And so I, I really kind of took a look at cannabis and saw everything that was going on from a regulatory standpoint. And with my background in construction, understood cost accounting. And, you know, that's a lot of the things that we deal with in the manufacturing side of the business, especially with the tax and having to do everything that goes into trying to maximize tax deductions. And so that's what kind of paved the way for me to start kind of getting into cannabis and building the relationships. Um, I was working independently and about a year in, I, I connected with uh, Anders with summit virtual CFO by Anders. Uh, They were going through a lot of growth again from a merger with two firms and then growing the consulting practice. uh, What we're doing now, virtual CFO and so they were looking for uh, niche leaders in verticals that they were growing in. Yeah. And um, and I was looking to really connect to grow what I was doing. And I said, at the end, I, I don't care. I really, all I want to do is help small business owners and help the industry thrive. I don't care how I do it. And and this was just a great way to do it because I love working with with people and a team that, you know, we're getting things done. So decided to join the firm and now, now I'm with Anders. Fantastic. That's really yeah. exciting. So I'm curious, Guillermo, what was it that originally attracted you to uh, plant medicine and natural wellness? Yeah, well, for me, it was COVID, you know, because what happened during COVID, even before then, I was starting to, you know, really kind of see what's what's best for me in terms of health, wellness. And, you know, I was teaching yoga, I was learning about Ayurvedic medicine, oh, but great. really what what pushed me forward was COVID because what I saw during COVID is that you know, the treatments for everything that was going on was pretty standardized, you know, at the company I was working with the treatment or the suggestion for, you know, how we move forward in the pandemic was one, one solution for all. Mm -hmm. And what I learned from, from Ayurvedic medicine is that, you know, we're all different. We need to tailor our approach to our own bodies, you know, our own experience. And so that's when I felt a little bit constrained in the corporate world and um and i felt that cannabis was pushing forward uh as an alternative you know i hope that someday it's kind of like what we go to but um really what 
what really mattered to me was the freedom of people to choose mm-hmm. uh, their own approach to their health and their well-being. Not so much yeah. pushing cannabis or plant medicine, but giving people the education and the choice to to see how they're going to get well, how they're going to thrive in life. And so that's really what motivates wow. me. That's great. That's really cool to hear. And I, I think it, you know, it's probably not an uncommon theme um, of, you know, post COVID response, just people saying, Hey, you know, we need a little bit more localized response, right? This whole having, you know, centralized authoritarian bodies commanding out edicts for everyone. And, you know, often with, um, with big pharma being big financial beneficiaries of those edicts, right? I think it's, it's caused a lot of folks to kind of say, Hey, wait a minute, you know, what about, what about these other natural medicines that people have been using for thousands of years? And, you know, if you continue to follow the money, it's, you know, you see that all the research is being done on the products that can then generate massive revenues for the pharmaceuticals. So we're not even seeing the type of real studies on plant medicines like cannabis to say, Hey, like, this, you know, is effective for X, Y, Z. So anyway, all, all that's to say, I think it's, uh, it's, it's cool to hear your story joining the industry. And I think that's, you know, a big part of what's driven a lot of uh, other executives into cannabis for sure. Yeah. And that's been the cool part of it is that, you know, every, that's, that's a really cool thing about being in this industry is that everywhere you go, everyone you talk to has their story and it's really driven by kind of more of a personal motivation. And so, you know, and trying to to work with clients or develop develop an, an advisory practice, um, it's really important to be passionate about it because of all the work that it takes to build the relationships, especially in cannabis, where I think um, you know most operators deal with higher prices than what most industries are used to dealing with, from banking to higher taxes, and so there's a little bit of uh, of a mistrust. And what I've found is that it takes time to build the the relationships and, you know, establish ourselves as, you know, a friend of the industry and we're, yeah. we're, we're here to help. <laughs> yeah. So how have you gone about doing that? Cause I totally agree. I mean, the cannabis industry today is still very much of a wild, wild West. You know, there's no kind of clear path for finding those connections and finding the right potential clients. So yeah. How did you, uh, how did you find the sector and how did you start, you know, building that Rolodex as you got more cannabis focused? Well, I would say I was all over the place at first and uh, didn't know what to do. Um, at the time that I started in this, I was living in uh, South Dakota, and this was not this summer, but last summer. And so uh, South Dakota was uh, voting on recreational use, as as you probably know, it didn't, it didn't move forward. So I uh, that was kind of my first way in as I, I joined a group out there that was going out, getting signatures, uh, doing some education, and then... Um, and then I moved to Texas. Um, so now I'm in San Antonio, but uh, just really a variety of things um, connecting with uh, with the NCIA. I sit on their uh, banking committee and um, going out to conferences and having the conversations because what I find that, um, you know, what we hear in cannabis is how difficult, you know, profitability is with price compression at the retail level. Of course, we know at the wholesale level as well. But really having the conversations with individual operators of, you know, what they've done to be successful. And I found all these conversations, you know, one by one have been have been really helpful in learning to to really get in the industry on a in, in a real way, you know, not as a yeah. as an outsider to see, you know, what are the things that are that are successful? Like one thing in California may not work in the Michigan market. And so sure. really just understanding what what the industry is faced with. Yep, that makes total sense. And so as you've gotten to um work uh in the finance departments of several cannabis companies and you know what um what are some of the unique attributes of the cannabis industry that you've discovered? I think for one is um we see a lot of this with with small business owners but um there's a there's no room for inefficiency, right? Um, I think that's one thing that's really unique about cannabis is that after the pandemic, you know, there was really high demand, there was less licenses, less competition, and really high profitability. And I think what we're still continue to see in cannabis, but still going to improve over time is uh, use, you know, data informed decisions, you know, and so I think that's a great opportunity for us as uh, advisors and virtual CFOs is to help continue to educate the industry about what are the metrics um, they need to be looking at um, at all levels, you know, but I, I tend to focus a little bit more on retail. So I think that's where the uh, 
the levers are and where, you know, the key to helping the overall supply chain is on the retail side. Um, so I focus a little bit more on that, but I think it's in, it's, it's unique in that it's, uh, it's evolving, you know, to a CPG type, you know, industry, un unlike other industries that are a little bit more established. And so mm -hmm. I think that's, what's really unique in that, um, we're still working out how to be profitable, how to really look at a market, learn the consumer base, um, to make everyday decisions on everything from product assortment to inventory to form factors, you know, all these different things that we look at, um, seems to be pretty unique and in, in cannabis in that it's, it's still evolving to, towards a more like CPG like industry. Makes total sense. Yeah. So as you talk about, you know, the taxes, obviously 280E is a ginormous oh, issue for that's cannabis. That's a good one, yeah. Yeah. How do you think about, um, you know, those tax issues that are faced by cannabis operators? You know, how have you found certain businesses able to uh, mitigate those taxes to, you know, as best they can? For one, I think it's horrible and unfair. That's, uh, first of all, um, you know, no business should have to operate under, uh, you know, a 280E scenario where we can't deduct uh, overhead expenses. So, so that's really tough. I think, um, I think your listeners are more investors. So everyone's pretty familiar with what 280 is, but basically, um, it's disallows overhead expenses and results in a really high effective tax rate. And so a cannabis operator may pay up to 70 to sometimes a hundred percent, uh, tax on net income, which really makes it hard to be profitable or, or generate any cash after taxes and so that is unique um overall in the industry we've seen a lot of capital flow in that has um has slowed down as you very well know better than me and so now is that is a time where with the lack of capital where we, the capital has to flow in from profitability right or it's going to be really tough over the next few years but that's what i'm really most excited about is from from a tax standpoint with the potential reschedule that would eliminate uh, essentially 280E. And the way I look at it, you know, what, one of the things we help our, our clients is to really benchmark, you know, what does your gross margin need to look like? We'll, we'll drill into the metrics. What does your basket size and your transactions need to look like? And what does your overhead need to look like? And so if we say, okay, we're at 50% gross margin and we're at a 30% overhead, we're at 20% net income uh, percentage with 280E, then it kind of wipes out your, your, your income, right? And so that's what we're going to start to see is the retailers that are profitable are going to be able to achieve 5, 10, 15% income after tax. And so that's something that's, that's really difficult and that we've seen that, you know, um, I know it's cannabis is compared a lot to technology where it's all in the valuation, but we know, if, you know, investors look at this and the reality is that there's, there's not the value there unless, you know, it can demonstrate profitability in this market. And so um, that is something that's really exciting. Potentially uh, we'll see, you know, timing, but um, to be able to get rid of uh of a 280e but um but no to your point of how we minimize um expenses i think what a lot of operators have done is just um there hasn't been as much spending on professional services on education because it's not deductible and so um the the best course of action is really just to be able to do your your cost accounting correctly to allocate as much of that cost up into cost of goods sold as you possibly can and we all know it's there's more opportunity at the cultivation and at the, at the manufacturing side, but for retail, it's essentially most of the overhead is, is non-deductible. So from a strategy standpoint, I just say the best strategy is to just increase profitability, right. To develop ways to be profitable in, in the current market. Cause there's only so much you can do from a tax standpoint to lower that effective tax rate, but there is a lot you can do to maximize profitability at the gross margin level. And so that's why I say the levers are there at the retail level to, to be able to get to know your consumer, to have a great, you know, best possible experience they can have and to increase customer retention and, uh, and improve profitability from there. Yeah, that makes sense. 
Are there any specific levers that you've seen, um, maybe like a more of a recurring theme where operators uh, could really extract more profitability out of those levers? You know, one thing um, we were talking before, right? And you said you you'd uh, you'd been at a couple conferences. We we're just that, like MJ Unpack. So I like the conferences because we get to see everyone's views, and I, I like to see if there's anything that seems to be reoccurring, um, as well as you know working with our clients. See, so like where that's the nice thing about being in a niche is that you know we get to see some some trends or some commonalities. One of the things that um, I kept hearing is how you know we talk about price compression consumers are buying off price they want more more items for less price it's reducing basket size which reduces revenue and gross margin but i've heard this that there's a a small portion uh maybe 30 to 40 percent of the consumer base probably more so in the flower category that are really driving price compression mm. and so with that tells me is that there's a lot of opportunity in other customer segments. And there's been a lot of retailers that have been profitable. Um, like just to give an example, just basically understanding um, consumers. If you have Gen Gen Z or Gen Y, I forget which one is that, that prefers a uh, more in the pre-roll category or um, whatever that may be, but really understanding those consumer bases and what form mm. factors are going to be using is really key to to maximizing uh, profitability. One of the other things that um, maybe we don't think about as much on the retail side is, um, you know, the retail has been taking a hit, and it affects. It's been affecting the the vendor side as well. You know, they kind of share in that. Um, and so what we talk about a lot is retailers working with those vendors to. Um, cause at the end of the day, the brands don't want those, uh, products sitting on the shelf is to, to ask for discounts, right. To, to, uh, to share in that, to get these products off, off the shelf and to really develop relationships with, with vendors. And so that's something that I've heard is, you know, a common theme is really developing relationships in the industry, um, particularly retail with the vendor to ensure that product is moving, that if there's any issues, you know, they're, they're being worked out, you know? And so these are just a kind of couple of examples that, you know, I say we really, it just, it's kind of like a daily thing. There's really no room for any, any inefficiencies, you know? Yeah. Yeah. No, that makes total sense. With regards to taxes payable, you know, we've seen a lot of uh, cannabis operators get pretty aggressive with that 280E payments and, and frankly, just, you know, not, not pay them. Right. And so is your working assumption that even if we get rescheduling, the IRS is still going to look to collect on those outstanding payables or how do you think about that? No. So the way I look at it is that really in, in the year that 280E is, um, I'm sorry that the reschedule happens, like, let's just say 2024, mm -hmm. the, the 280E is, um, will effectively go away. And so for tax planning purposes, what what we do with every client, um, regardless of industry, is that we do cash planning where we'll try to set a target goal of 10 to 30% of revenue based on the cash conversion cycle and that kind of thing. But we also set up a separate reserve account for tax purposes where we're allocating tax every quarter and then making those estimated tax payments. And so what I would advise, because the last thing that, you know, that our clients want is a, a surprise at the end of the year from a tax sure. standpoint, doesn't make us look good. doesn't help for, for uh, planning purposes, but to continue to plan for that as if 280E is still in effect, if at the end of the year, you know, there is a, uh, additional cash we can move out of that tax reserve, then we'll do that. But we'll definitely continue to allocate the cash into a reserve for tax purposes. So we'll have that at the end of the year. But yeah, I mean, we don't advise to be too aggressive with um, with the 280E. It's pretty clear cut. And that's one thing that's already just been established um, in the courts. Um, there may be some, some vagueness with transportation companies, but from a plant touching company, it's pretty straightforward and the accounting's pretty straightforward on how we can allocate costs to maximize the the uh the offset to taxable income. So that's how we work with our clients. That makes total sense. 
Um, and so as you think about, you know, folks who may be listening, if they are a cannabis operator who could potentially use uh, outsource CFO help, I mean, what well, what is your typical uh, client target and who are you most helpful for? Yeah, like I said, I talk a lot about retail, but we work with, with uh, cannabis companies all across the spectrum. What we've seen is that companies that are, you know, under 2 million, um, can't quite pay for the service yet, uh, or unless they're growing rapidly. Um, and companies over 20 million tend to hire someone in house. So most of our clients are right in that two to 20 million range. Although we do work with some clients that are as large as 60 million. And so in other industries. And so, um, that's really right about what, where we see where it makes most sense to hire a virtual CFO. Mm -hmm. The other thing I will say is that it's a very, um, work with clients that have that, you know, that growth mindset that really want to engage and we get to learn their business really from, from engaging with them. It's not something we just come in and do. It's really a partnership. And so those are the clients that we work uh, <clears throat> best with that want to develop that relationship and we want to work together and it's very collaborative um, and help and understand, you know, where you want to go, your individual goals and how we're going to get there. Great. Thanks. Great. Yeah. And uh, so is there somewhere that folks can reach out to you if they want to get in touch? Yeah, I would say just go to summitcpagroup.net um, and then you'll you'll find our landing page there that has my information. Uh, you can put a, put your information there and schedule an appointment. You could also look on LinkedIn and I'm pretty Googleable by now. So just, <laughs> just uh, Google my name, Guillermo Rodriguez, maybe cannabis industry, and you'll find me there. Fantastic. Well, Guillermo, this has been so much fun. Really appreciate you coming on the show today and uh, helping us all understand the ins and outs of cannabis accounting. Thanks, Jordan. Appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Have a great rest of your afternoon. All right. You as well.